This is a documentary created to show the unfinished state of most of the recently released AAA games. Most AAA games that have been released have been heavily underdeveloped, having several glitches and bugs that make the game almost unplayable. One example of a game company using this mindset is the developers unpublished but publishers of Overwatch 2, Activision Blizzard, and the cancellation of the main selling point of the game, the PvE or player versus environment and the story mode campaign. Many people were infuriated by this decision and as a result Overwatch 2's game rating plummeted to a 1.5 out of 10. Another example is the developers of the Pokemon franchise in Game Freak. Over the last few years, Game Freak has got a reputation for being lazy during the production of their games, and especially the most recent games, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Despite being the highest grossing franchise of all time, its development has become sloppy. Four years ago, during the development of Sword and Shield, Game Freak received a lot of backlash due to the low resolution of some of their assets. Despite this, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet have been one of the buggiest Pokemon games to be released. As a result, both games received an extremely low rating of a 3.3 for Pokemon Scarlet and a 4.0 for Pokemon Violet. Um, I think DLC roadmaps are really good because it kind of shows what needs, what is going to be released. So maybe if you want to plan ahead, but also like if it doesn't have a roadmap and you can just like shove it out there, it can also kind of like create hype for it. But with, well, it doesn't really create like massive amounts of hype. But you kind of n don't know what it does, so the fans might think, oh, what's it going to be? But then also DLC roadmaps can. Especially with like AAA companies, create with uh, like single player games, can just create massive amounts of hype. Uh, day one DLC, I think it really depends on how you go about it because day one DLC, you can either have it as something. It might be like a pre-order bonus that you make. So like, if you don't pre-order the game, you can pay for it, or if it's uh, something like extra, like a totally extra thing. But a lot of the time, it does go bad because it's just kind of making someone pay for something that probably should have should have and could have been in the game itself. Uh, DLC, day one DLC, I, I don't, I dislike it because I feel like too much of, too many of the day one DLCs just contain stuff that should have already been in the game to begin with. It's just a lazy cop out to get even more money. Um, there are some good day one DLCs, so for example, um, if you pre-ordered Super Smash Bros. Ultima, you would have gotten an entirely new character. Uh, and however, if you didn't and you just got it on the same day, you could have paid and gotten the, the, the character. So I feel like that's a good example of day one DLC. As a whole, though, I feel like too many times it's just a bit of a lazy uh, DLC roadmaps. I feel they're quite good because they give the fans some example of like, or like some idea of what to expect and it sort of uh, builds up fan like fandom hype for it you know people are excited for it so it's very important to deliver on those types of things however I feel like sometimes there's uh, there's uh, sort of um, that they can kind of under deliver or they can, for example, some characters in Smash, uh, they were revealed through the uh, DLC, the roadmaps, and when they came out, they were just completely uh, broken and just ruined the sort of game uh, balancing, if you will. I've got really t two really good examples of DLCs. Um, the game, uh, the Bethesda game Dishonored, basically has it so most of the DLCs are either um, online competitive like um, challenges or adds like entirely new stories to the game and then one of them adds like just extra stuff for like more fun inside the game and it's a single player game so the more stuff doesn't add like a competitive advantage to that uh, to that game 
Um, and the other uh, example of really good DLC is uh, is Smash because it has this kind of like you, it just adds extra fighters, and so it just makes more fun since it already has like loads of characters. It has like 50 characters already, and it adds like 10, 15 new characters for kind of everyone. But the thing is, I think they went a bit. It went a bit worse because those characters a lot of the time were much more overpowered than the characters than the average characters in the game kind of creating metas especially for the online community to kind of focus on DLC characters. Uh, I feel like there's a few DLC, uh, few games that use DLC well. Uh, one example would be Hollow Knight which had three sets of DLCs which were all completely free and they all added uh, different modes, different stories, different endings to the game and they just, um, they're really beloved by the fans because of how well they are. Uh, another example of a game using DLC well would be um, The Witcher 3, uh, which had both free and paid for DLCs and in, in both cases the DLCs are really beloved and even though, um, even though they are like extra stuff, the Witcher 3 has DLC that some fans consider to be better than the actual game itself. Uh, so it just shows that when used properly, a DLC can really, it can boost an already amazing game to even further heights, uh, to even further heights. Uh, a game, a game using DLC badly would be Pokemon Sword and Shield, which, um, they had two pieces of DLC and what they did was they added two new, two small uh, areas to the map and a couple of new uh, Pokemon and for that they you had to play you had to pay 25 pounds for each DLC so you, you paid the price of a full game just to get a smaller uh, a smaller piece M most of the time the same companies that uh, have a decrease in quality also expect you to pay more for it so going back to where you know pokemon is just it's it's gotten to a point where they just they're pumping out games every single year uh, they've got multiple divisions in the studio that are just they're working on different games at the same time and what what happens is that the game suffers for it so it's no longer it's no longer out of love that they make it, it's just them chasing money, they, they know that the franchise is profitable and what they'll do is they'll just go and they'll just basically pump up more and more money, uh, they'll just try and like pump up more games to get more money. Um, another series, Assassin's Creed, it's just, it's, it's changed so much from the original uh, games that it's just it's no longer recognizable as the same franchise they just they've changed the entire point of the games and the change the entirety of like how it's the, how the story is presented it's and uh, it's just it's changed to the point where no original fan wants to get any of the new games it's just that uh, different from how it used to be and it's just that uh, it, the, the games no longer have any passion towards them they're just it's for the sake of making money that they're made that's a very big problem with the kind of online expectance of uh, and the online kind of interconnectedness of companies and a lot of companies nowadays they kind of like have this thing of oh we're so big that um, we can do whatever we want people will buy the game and we will make a profit so especially with uh, Cyberpunk, the game was a lot of the time back uh, in the back scenes, you could expect it, but it's, mo it's not really a problem with the studios, it's a problem with the companies behind the studios, because they invest into something and they have this expectance of, oh it needs to be released by this day or by this month, and they, what if the company, if the directors say, no, we can't because it won't be finished by then, they said, yeah, but we've invested in you, so why don't we just take our money out of it? So it's kind of this like going down to this level of, oh, we need to please all of these like CEOs and investors in a company and in a game, and it kind of like t 
and it really adds this kind of like horrible nature to like where there's kind of like soul it's really soulless behind games and it's it's really really bad in AAA because what's mainly in AAA where they have like investors in games and it has this thing of um, nobody can really like chain, change it unless you change kind of the entire system of how it interacts and it's kind of like evolution of like it kind of started in the early 2010s when online especially with Xbox that kind of like added the thing of oh it needs to be online it needs to be all of this and people kind of expect this thing of like oh it's not what's good for the game it's just what how to get the most amount of people to play your game with it having absolutely no soul to it On release, well, the most recent example would be uh, Tears of, uh, the Legends of the Tears of the Kingdom because um, it was actually leaked recently that they took an, that it was actually finished last March, but they took an entire year to fix just basically every single bug, and so they just had all of this inter internal stuff where they just postponed the game um, to make sure it was absolutely as solid as possible before release. Um, but then there's obviously people who found like small exploits or something like that, but then it's fixed pretty pretty quickly. The games come down to a sort of case-by-case -case scenario. There's no one series that has every game be amazing because there'll be misses and all of that. I feel like a recent example of an amazing uh, day one build quality would be uh, Tears of the Kingdom, uh, Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. When it came out, it just, it was, uh, uh, ever since it's come out, it's been, it's had like massive amounts of fame, you know, like lots of millions of copies sold because of how much passion was put into it and how much uh, quality there was to it. And you can tell that the, that the people working there really enjoyed making the game and it like really resonated with the fans. Uh, again, Hollow Knight, when it came out, you know, it was really well made and it was just the amount of care that was put into it resonated with people and it's because of that care that they put into it that these games are successful. You, like the people who play it can tell that the people who make it, they, they care about, they don't care about money like certain companies like Game Freak. They actually, you know, care about putting a piece of art out there. Because microtransactions are, um, well, mic microtransactions are when you pay for usually like an in-game currency from real currency at like a fixed rate um, for like internal game stuff. Most of the time, it's in online games, and I think unless it's say like an MMO RPG, it should never give competitive advantage to to someone who has it. Uh, but then there's also this big thing of like gambling with it um, and it creates this kind of like really like horrible mess of um, like everyone trying to get that one thing because it does give a competitive advantage um, but then also a lot of the time it is done pretty well but it obviously will bring a competitive advantage for those games unless it's pure unless the the currency in the game is purely cosmetic but then it also adds this entire thing of like oh if you don't have this one thing or if you don't have like skins in a game oh that means you're just bad at the game so unless you kind of like pump all of this money into this one game you're just bad at the game and it kind of creates this like toxicity within the fan base uh, I don't like my tr microtransactions in games because uh, I feel like too many uh, games just they they push microtransactions so companies like EA are infamous for it just microtransactions at every turn um, when Star Wars Battlefront came out you know you to get uh, certain heroes in the game you had to like you had to play for like hours like over like a hundred hours just to get one of the cat of like the stronger characters and it was either that, either you ground, grind away for like hours on end, or with no, little to no uh, results, or you were you had the option to pay and just like circumvent it entirely. 
Um, so I feel like too many times uh, companies just um, they they push micro they put microtransactions in your face. They kind of give you with little to no option. Um, I feel like certain times there are uh, there are good and bad ones. So for example, uh, in Smash Bros. Ultima, uh, you can use microtransactions to uh, buy new fighters and characters. However, uh, these characters, despite like they add a, like a breath of fresh air, you know, they're much beloved by the fan. Uh, they are very uh, game breaking. They are like significantly stronger than the base characters that you can have in the game. So it feels like if you don't have those characters, you don't, uh, you aren't able to like fight on the same level as them. So it feels like they're pushing it uh, too much. Uh, like the, they're pushing the much the option of microtransactions in your face. Really, uh, I feel like microtransactions should only really ever be as a cosmetic thing, or like it shouldn't impact um, the game experience itself it should just kind of be like an extra thing or like a benefit to you not it shouldn't like break the game that you're doing overall i think most triple a games are built to make you buy the absolute minimum at launch then make you pay more for dlc that should have already been in the game or scrapped ideas or content this is supported by the idea of day one dlc on top of the increase in price for triple a games People are often spending more money to receive the same or sometimes less content with more bugs or glitches.